I'm Ben Freed. Uh, I'm Google's CIO. I'm one of the site leads here in New York. And uh, I am thrilled and overwhelmed to welcome the, screen, the playwright and cast of To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> It seems redundant to have to introduce the crew here, but I will. Celia Keenan Bolger, uh, Gideon Glick, Aaron Sorkin, Jeff Daniels, Benga Akanagbe. Nagbe. I'm trying the glottal, the glottal G. I'm sorry, not enough practice. <laughs> and I have actually a summary of that I was given from the publicists of the play. Do I need to summarize To Kill a Mockingbird <laughs> for this audience? No, that seems it seems it seems like there's better uses of our time. Um, so anyway, so welcome. We're really, really, really excited to have you all here. Thank you very much. Um, and I guess a big week, nine Tony Awards? Congratulations. Uh, nine nominations. Tony Award nominations. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nine Tony Award nominations. I hope I didn't jinx it. Nine Tony Award nominations, including <laughs> to Jeff, to Gideon, and to Celia. Uh, well done. And you set a record for, is it highest grossing American play? Yeah, look to Aaron. Uh, yeah, uh, we're actually the first, second, third, and fourth highest grossing uh, American play. We, we broke our own record for it. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> it was, I guess it was announced in 2016 that Aaron was going to be adapting the, the novel into a play. I guess to start, uh, Aaron, what led you there? What led you to, to the project? Uh, where did your interest come from? The producer, Scott Rudin, with whom I've worked a uh, number of times, called me and he said, I have something very exciting to talk to you about. After trying for a long time, I've acquired the stage rights for To Kill a Mockingbird. And he, uh, he asked me to, to write the play. Uh, and uh, I, I, honestly, I felt like it was a suicide mission. But I, I just, <laughs> um, uh, the, the idea of doing a play, and I just love doing plays, uh, uh, I, and he was dangling the director Bartlett Chair uh, in front of me, and uh, uh, you know the, the the chance to work with him. We knew in that first phone call that it was going to be Jeff uh, playing Atticus, so the chance to work with Jeff again, um, I, uh, you know, was what made me say, "Well, go ahead on the suicide mission." Um, and uh, I I wrote a first draft that was. Terrible. Um, I, it was really the, the best you could say about it was that it was harmless, which is probably the worst thing you could say about a play, and particularly uh, a To Kill a Mockingbird. It was, uh, I, I, I was very gentle. I um, uh, didn't want to ruin anyone's childhood. Um, and so I just I took the most necessary scenes in the book and I stood them up. And the whole thing ended up just reading like a, a greatest hits album done by a cover band. Uh, there was really just nothing to it uh, at all. And Scott Rudin, the producer, told me so. Uh, uh, and, uh, and he was right. Um, uh, but the big thing he said, uh, and, and this was my big motivation going forward, was simply this, was that, uh, and I assume I'm talking to a room full of people who have uh, uh, read the book, seen the movie, or both. Here's what he said, Atticus can't be Atticus from the beginning uh, of the play to the end of the play. Uh, uh, he has to change. He has to be put through something, and he has to change. And uh, I thought, of, of course. Uh, I mean, I, I, the, a protagonist has to have a flaw, has to be put through something, and has to change. And uh, flying home, uh, I live most of the time in Los Angeles, I, I just kept wondering, how did, I, how did Harper Lee get away with uh, an Atticus in the novel that was that didn't change. That was the same at the beginning of the novel as he was at the end. How did Horton Foote, who wrote the screenplay, get away with an Atticus who was at the beginning, same at the beginning, uh, at the end of the movie uh, as he was at the beginning? And the answer is that Atticus is not the protagonist uh, in the book or in the movie. Scout is. Um, she changes. She loses some of her innocence and her flaws that she's young. Uh, and uh, I wanted to keep Scout and Dill and, uh, and Jem, who's played by Will Pullen, uh, I wanted to keep them as protagonists. I want, wanted them to change, but I wanted to move Atticus front and center, make him a protagonist, put him through something. And that, that, is, that was the impetus for the next draft uh, uh, that I did. And uh, uh, I did that draft over the course of about six months, sent it to Scott. 
And the way I knew that he liked it um, uh, wasn't from him calling me and telling me. It was that uh, six days later, in the Sunday New York Times Arts and Leisure section, <laughs> in the fall preview, oh he took out a two-page ad uh, saying, To Kill a Mockingbird, a new play by Aaron Sorkin, opening Christmas 2018. Um, and there we were. So he's a man of action. <laughs> so a question for all of you. You had, I read, something like 18 months of rehearsal time. How did the play develop over the rehearsal? And uh, did it develop over the course of the performances? I, I say that having seen you all perform it on the first week of November, and then having seen it again the week before last. So it seems like things happen. You learned along the way. What was that like? What happened? How did you develop your characters? And I would say one of the great joys of this process was watching Aaron, who I have admired for a very, very long time, um, write and rewrite this play and understand uh, what sort of needed to be pulled out, where he needed to sort of cut the fat. So a lot a lot of the beginning process was that, was, was us sitting around a table, reading it, Aaron going away, coming back with a new draft, going away. I mean, and that happened. We did two readings. We did some workshops. And during one of the workshops, Bart Shear, uh, the director, he was like, this section seems hard. And so let's <laughs> try to stage it. And I had never worked on something. Usually when you begin a theatrical process, there's like the set model and the costume renderings. and um, and they're like, this is what it's going to look like. And in the version, in this version, none of that existed. So the designers were coming, they were watching how we were trying to build the play. And it was truly like one of the most collaborative experiences I've ever had because then, you know, we started putting things up on their feet and Miriam, the set designer was like, you know, maybe we could have the jury over here and we could have the porch could come in from the sides. And like, that's now what our <laughs> set looks like. So we went through all of that developmental process of trying to figure out what, you know, how we were going to tell the story. And then we had six weeks of rehearsal and six weeks of previews. And the previews were really when <laughs> shit got crazy. <laughs> um, because Aaron just kept at it. And I remember like the second week of previews, I was like, it's ready, we're ready. And then six weeks later, I was like, here we are, <laughs> still putting in new Aaron Sorkin dialogue every single night. <laughs> and you know, we would, we would rehearse a version during the day. We would put it on its feet. And then at the end of the day, we would say, it's no good. We're not going to do that. We're going to do the version we did last night. Mm -hmm. And then we would come in the next day with something new. And they would say, it's really good, but it's not ready. So you do the version that you did last night, tonight, but tomorrow we'll put the version in that you rehearsed today. Oh my God. So your brain is just doing like a lot of mental Sorkinese gymnastics. <laughs> um, and that was really, I mean, it's exhilarating. And also you're like, you know, these people did pay a lot of money <laughs> to be here. So like, don't ruin it for them. Um, so that's sort of a snapshot of what that looked like. Wow. Anything you all, any of you want to add to that? What happened? With that was <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, as a perhaps naive audience member, I had a, a question that has to do with the performance, which is, uh, you know, to people who are literate in TV and in movies, the the fractured narrative that you have that intersperses the trial and segment with a different, more linear narrative. It's very natural to watch. But I realized the second time I saw the play, that can't be that natural to perform. And that was before I even knew that you were switching it up and kind of you were jumping backwards and forwards across takes on the performances. Is that kind of fractured timeline hard to, to work through as, as actors? Is, it, is there lots of switching and you have to keep track of tense and am I an adult now, am I a child? Oh, we, yeah. heard, we heard that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't like those conversations. <laughs> You're like, enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we had a, a I think it's still even in process, and that's kind of the beautiful thing about theater is that uh, sometimes we were sure we were adults in one scene or in one narration, and now we're just not, and, and vice versa. And I'll say, it, it is challenging to have 
sometimes you have an emotional response to something that happened maybe four minutes ago, but now there's a narration in, in the middle of it, and then it comes back, and now we're at the end of that scene again. So then you have to be emotionally present. So you're kind of, it's like a weird juggling act that you're doing, where you're, you're trying to, to ride the wave, but also kind of sit in the emotion at the same time. And, and for, for them, in addition to the juggling act of uh, uh, am, I an, am I an adult, am I a kid uh, right now, they also talk to the audience. Yeah, they break. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's more than just exposition, especially uh, uh, with Scout. She's, she's trying to puzzle something through uh, with them. Once that happens, um, then the logic, th their, their logic uh, on stage, you have to ask yourself, Wait, if I'm talking to the audience, aren't I in the Schubert Theater uh, uh, right now? And where, but I'm also in Makeham, and I might be a little kid, I might be an adult, and we never actually say how old the adult uh, a version uh, uh, of the person is. So uh, it uh, it is a lot for uh, uh, the actors to get their arms around. Uh, less gifted actors than Celia and Gideon uh, and Will Pullen, um, I think either would just become frustrated with it or would not bother to deal with it. Would, it would just kind of be general. I also think, like so many things in life, the, the, that problem which presented itself during the rehearsal, which was like the thorniest and the most frustrating, in the running of it and the doing of it every night has become the most gratifying. That, And because we had a good director and a good writer who didn't feel the need to give absolutes about the answers that we were in pursuit of, it stayed open-ended, but we had a foundation that was strong enough that now the doing of it, because it isn't so clear or linear, I think is actually more interesting to do it if you have to do it eight times a week. <laughs> For a year. <laughs> well, as an audience member, I can get that because you never consciously ask yourself, wait, like what point is it in this character's life right now, right? It just, you just absorb it and you just, you, you, you feel it without it having to have been explained to you, even as it changes. That's helped right away. It's, it's more than helped. It's set up right away by Bart Chair, uh, our director, and the design uh, of the play. Miriam Buther uh, was our set designer, Jeff, Jennifer Tipton, the lighting designer, and Anne Roth, the costume designer. And when the curtain uh, goes up on the play, and it's actually not a curtain at all, it's a, yeah. it's a wall that um, kind of resembles the, the side of a barn, but weathered. Um, uh, it, it hasn't been tended to in uh, 60 years uh, or so. When that goes up, if you know To Kill a Mockingbird, and most people who are sitting in the theater do, you're expecting to see a front porch, right, or a bucolic rural street, maybe an oak tree. Um, you don't see any of that. You see something that resembles the place where they shot the Childish Gambino video, uh, This is America. <laughs> it, it's an abandoned warehouse, again, a place that has, it's, it's, it's a warehouse structure, uh, but again, it hasn't been tended to, uh, uh, visited in a long time. There are broken windows, uh, and paint is peeling. Um, uh, and Scout is standing on stage alone with a newspaper in the first line of the play as something didn't make sense. And so what happens is, because of that, uh, the, at least the effect is we're revisiting something, this story that hasn't been revisited uh, in a long time, and we're going to ask questions about it. And I guess that was a very long way of saying, because we don't start off the play in a literal space, yeah. they bring in the literal space. When they start talking about what the courtroom looked like, uh, then characters right. are coming on, they bring in the literal space. Uh, I, I couldn't tell them where exactly they are uh, uh, when the play begins. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to. Wow. You said it once. I did, but you didn't like the answer. No, so I loved it. It was just oh. not, it was like a beautiful, what did you oh, say? Really? It was uh, oh, like, damn it. I, I, it was like space or something. I wouldn't have said that. No. I'm, I'm glad that it was helpful and I wish I could remember it now. Was it that? 
I said the astral time, plane, space, the time-space continuum. Continuum, that's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, slight shift of subject. So, J Jeff, uh, moving Jeff's on. Lose his mind. <laughs> Jeff. We're in the time space continuum. Uh, Jeff, a, que a question for you. I, <laughs> someone described Atticus Finch to me as the patron saint of fatherhood, at least as captured by Horton Foote and by Harper Lee. And uh, that seems like kind of a, a heavy burden to carry. Uh, did, did the new take on the character and this idea of, of, uh, of a journey and development make the approach easier or less daunting? Or maybe it wasn't daunting? And You know, when Aaron said, do you want to do Atticus? It was like, of course, yeah. I, I wanted challenges uh, I, ever since uh, Newsroom and, and some other things before that. God of Carnage, I've just been going, if you aren't challenged, then don't, don't do this anymore. And, and this is the ultimate challenge. I mean, you're taking on not only Gregory Peck, but you're taking on paternal saint of whatever, fatherhood, yeah. <laughs> and whatever that means to people. Whoever Atticus is in their own minds having read the book 27 times, you're taking on all that. Yeah. And I didn't blink. I just didn't, whether it's naive or whether it's just innocence or whatever it is. You know what? Um, I mean, this is Google. You hit delete. <laughs> you hit delete on all of that stuff because it isn't the Horton Foot script, and it isn't the book. It's a play based on the book, and it's it's what Aaron is doing with it. And I know how to get around Aaron and how to how to execute Aaron in a way that he can. And to be in a rehearsal room with him where he gets the time to rewrite. That was the battle on newsroom. Really, yeah. was that he had to turn it in Thursday at noon. That's it. That's it. And every two weeks, this guy would come out with 75 pages of how the hell does he do it? Wow. But to watch him have the time to really do what playwrights do, which is what he is, um, it, was, it was thrilling. So I knew, I knew we had, if we're going to climb Mount Everest, and Harper Lee, and the Pulitzer, and Gregory Peck, and the, all the people who love the book, then who do you want in your foxhole? And you start there yeah. as an actor. You got Scott Rudin, who is the producer you need for something like this and the journey this, this one took. Bart Shear, who directs operas in his spare time. <laughs> you know? And then you get into that first reading, and you get these people. I mean, these people were all here in that first reading, I think, way back in October. Other people kind of came and went, but not these three. And I said, if we can, and will pull one also, if we can get the, <laughs> we got a core group that can now take this thing on. And now it's, you know, pedal to the metal and fifth gear and all that. Now let's go. Who's with me? Who's going? And these people were from day one. Let's go. And didn't blink. And that, that was thrilling. We may have failed. Well. Oh my God, yeah. This had failure written all over it. Oh. He does not measure up to Mr. Peck. I'm so sorry. What he does to the, to the book is criminal. And why do you have three adults playing children? <laughs> this is terrible. all, going into that first preview, that was all on the table. And, and it all worked. And that's what, that's what makes it even more gratifying. It, it really did. Hey, Benga, a question for you. So first of all, this is your, your Broadway debut. Do I have that right? Yes. Well done. Well done, sir. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> so you wrote this really powerful piece in, for the Washington Post uh, some time ago um, about the show as how the show has affected you. And I was struck by the way that you speak about how far we have not come for African Americans, for black Americans, about uh, the feelings of safety that you don't have, about how uh, the experience of being Tom Robinson every night fills your life as you go through it. Um, what more can you tell us? Can you tell this audience about the, I mean, the process? How do you, how do you fill Tom? How do you, how do you let that go at the end of a day? Brownies and ice cream every night, <laughs> every single night. <laughs> um, not exaggerating. He's not kidding. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Um, what she described as far as the, the development process and the rehearsal process was, was quite accurate. This was, for me, for a lot of us, this was the most organic 
coming to being of a piece that, that I, we've ever been a part of, at least, at least for me. Um, having been able to workshop it with them for, for over a year and then, and then uh, the rehearsal period and then the, the, the previews, which went twice as long as normal previews go. So it, it really just really baked into us. Um, but sitting around the table and, and having these minds and these artists and Aaron like really work do do this work in front of us with us it 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 felt it felt like a safe space where we could create you know whatever this was going to be and and it helped me like open up and let go into what t this this world which was not that we were creating which is not was not and is not safe for black people and and, and open up and and like and and live that um and it was it's, it was funny because when we left the basement of Lincoln Lincoln Center, I, I was reluctant. I was like, I was like, why do we have to move? Let's let's, let's continue to do this yeah. for us. Like every like every day. I, it was it was very gratifying. It was we it was time for us to get the hell out of that basement. But <laughs> it was like, but but it it I had forgotten that it was ever going to be part of or not uh, disassociated from the fact that it was going to be on a Broadway stage that it was based on a book that so many Americans felt ownership of it was it was just us doing it for us in that basement and just like working on it working on it which I I loved um so that helped when it was time to go to that stage and 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 just do what we have like like everything that Jeff said like if we just we got the band together and like, all right, you know how to you know work on that bass. You know how to you know, you know tune the amp. Let's. So we got together and just like, do what we started to learn to do and what we loved doing. Um, and then when we started to do it in front of audiences, and you could feel, especially the first few weeks, that audiences sh showed up, just daring us to screw up their childhood. You're like, I, I wish you would. Really. I wish you would. Uh -huh. And then you then then. It, that started to change when they felt like they could trust us with it. But to, to answer your question, like having that process leading up to it I, is what enabled me to, to be able to, to, to do this there. Now, I, you mentioned the Washington Post piece that came out this weekend, I, I, or this past weekend. I, I, I wrote that because what I didn't realize was how doing that, playing this role, in front of so many people, so so many white people with disposable income, like wh how that would have affect me. I did not, I did not see that coming, um, and every night. And can we curse? <laughs> it started to fuck with me. And, <laughs> yeah, please, and please. So, and so I just needed to, to get it out and express it somehow, and, and I was fortunate enough to be able to find a, a, a platform, a venue to do so. But it's still, it's still something I, I process and taking in, taking into everything that we worked on into that rehearsal space. You know, when it came to race and and the use of the N word and class and so on, and, and understanding it intellectually, and then when we get and, and creatively. But when I got out there on the stage, it. it like the creative and the intellectual was like right out the door because I'm, I'm looking at like an audience full of people who most likely share the same politics as I do, but are definitely uh, benefactors of this really fucked up system. And I'm playing this role in front of them. So it was just like, this is like, this is crazy. But I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it was a, it's a beautiful opportunity as well. So did I answer it? You, I, yes. I, I, yeah, I really was... recommend the, the piece. It's, uh, uh, for, it's, for, it's magnificently written. I found it fascinating. Uh, and it's online. Uh, if you know how to Google it. Um... <laughs> we, we, can, we can provide some help for that. <laughs> so on the subject of process and kind of touching on differences with the source material a little bit, it was hard for me not to read recent events into into the play, a, a modern. It was hard for me not to hear echoes of Ferguson mm -hmm. and Charlottesville and the murder of James Byrd, whose killer was executed in, back at the end of April. Mm -hmm. It was hard. Those seemed to be explicit references to, to the language, like I said, the language of Charlottesville and the events of Ferguson and the murder of James Byrd. Am I just hallucinating? Is that was was there intent to, to bring that? You're, you're not. Hallucinating after that first draft, which I, I just think like, scared me into uh, t taking a, a chance doing something better. Um, uh, one of the things that 
um, that I, I sort of uh, you know vowed to do was that I, I wasn't going to pretend that I was writing the play in 1960. Um, uh, I'm writing it now. Things have happened uh, since then. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that happened, uh, uh, you know, I, I had mentioned uh, before that Atticus, now as the central protagonist, needed a flaw. Uh, in the book, in the movie, he doesn't have one. He's a guy <clears throat> carved out of marble. Uh, and he's the guy who has all the answers. And in the play, I wanted him wrestling with the questions. Um, uh, so in searching for a flaw, and I thought, you know, boy, if, uh, if I wasn't going to get killed before giving Atticus a flaw, what am I going to do? Um, you know, turn him from a bad lawyer into a good lawyer, a bad father into a good father, uh, a racist into someone who believes in equality uh, and justice. Uh, I realized I didn't have to give him a flaw that Harper, he already had one. It's just that uh, when I learned the book, at least in uh, seventh, eighth, or ninth grade, um, and I'll bet people still today that it's regarded as a virtue, which is that Atticus believes that there is goodness uh, in everyone. Atticus, throughout the book, excuses racism. Um, he, ex he, he excuses uh, Bob Ewell as someone who just lost his WPA job, so please, you got to understand. Uh, excuses Mrs. DeBose as someone who recently stopped taking her uh, uh, medication, her morphine, so you got to understand. He excuses the whole town of Maycomb. Uh, things happen slower here. This is the Deep South. Don't, don't worry. They'll, they'll uh, uh, catch up. There's goodness in everyone. All you have to do is... Uh, crawl around inside uh, their skin for a while. There's goodness in everyone. There's goodness in everyone. And while I was uh, kind of dealing with this as something which now, uh, a, a long time after I'd read the book for the first time and sort of formed my thoughts about Atticus, who'd always been a hero, still is, um, uh, suddenly this was like a pebble in my shoe. I, I wasn't crazy uh, uh, about this part of Atticus. Right smack in the middle of thinking that, Donald Trump said there are fine people on both sides. Uh, that's what it is. Um, uh, Atticus is going to have to, by the end of the play, understand that there aren't uh, uh, fine people on both sides. And that his other mantra uh, uh, throughout the play, which is, I know these people. Um, uh, my, my family, we've lived in this and make them for generations. I know these people. There are friends and neighbors. I know these people. Sure, some of them are still stuck in the old ways, but none of them are so far gone that they would send an obviously innocent man uh, to the electric chair. He's learned that he's wrong about that, too. And I, I felt like that feels like today, too, that a lot of us uh, for the last few years, no matter where you are on the, uh, on the ideological spectrum, a lot of us have felt like, God, I, I thought I knew uh, my neighbors in this country. I, I, I thought I knew everybody else. I didn't. I, I had, uh, like personally, um, and a, a lot of people here will roll their eyes and say, you know, welcome uh, uh, to reality. Uh, I had no idea the level of misogyny um, uh, until Hillary Clinton ran for president. Um, it's not sexism, straight up misogyny. Anyway, you ask, did uh, the current... <laughs> you, you exceeded... Uh, you have to understand, growing up in my family, anybody who used one word when they could have used ten just wasn't trying hard enough. <laughs> <that. laughs> um, so, did what's going on now... Yes, it just made its way into the air supply of the play, into the water supply. Oh. So, s something you mentioned, it's, it's Calpurnia who challenges... Mm -hmm. uh, Atticus, with especially about Mrs. Dubose, it calls on mind. She was she was a racist before she got sick. She was Six. a Negro hating sack of dirt before uh, it was medicinally enhanced. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that, there's a reason you're the writer. So, um, <laughs> the the two primary African American characters have an agency and an independence that isn't present in the prior material at all. And how do you think about? I mean. It's amazing, Tom is, if you'll go back to the source material, is very lightly sketched, if, if at all. Maybe he's kind of a Christ-like figure, but we, we get no insight into him. And as an audience member, the thing that I saw that was so impressive was a man finding agency in a situation where his victimhood is assured. 
and where he has no actual, he for good reason has no expectation of just treatment, but he finds a path to agency and to expression that wasn't present in the prior work. And in a different way, Cal expresses a voice, right, a grounded voice that we don't see uh -huh. elsewhere. I guess, how, how did, for, really for the, the two of you, how did you think about bringing those ideas into the play? And it, it's, I think it's a big change that really adds to the power immeasurably. Yes, you're right. There, there, there are two only two only two significant African American characters uh, in the book: Calpurnia, Tom Robinson, um, and uh, in, in a in a play about um, uh, the racial friction in the Jim Crow South. That neither of the two African American characters that really have anything to say about it. And you're right; they don't have uh, uh, agency. Um, and I would, I, I always want to tread lightly here because I, I, I do not want to give the impression that in writing the play, I set out to correct mistakes that I perceived Harper Lee made. It, it's not it at all. It's simply, again, that I wasn't going to pretend I was writing the play in 1960, uh, and I wasn't going to try to do a Harper Lee uh, impersonation. So I was just following my own instincts uh, a little bit. Uh, I thought, A, uh, you, you, you simply, you can't use African-American characters only as atmosphere. Um, uh, and B, what a waste. Uh, I, I, these are two characters that can, uh, uh, that can be sensational characters and add to kind of the, the conversation uh, of the play. So with Tom, um, Tom gets to make decisions now. Um, uh, he, he, he makes the decision uh, uh, now, and I, I don't want to give away too many spoilers if you haven't seen the play. He makes the decision to go to court. Um, uh, when this play begins now, he has a different lawyer, not Atticus, who, and he's taken a, a plea bargain 18 years. Um, uh, and he, uh, uh, then he makes a different decision uh, uh, after talking to Atticus. All of these decisions are based on what is best for his kids. Uh, uh, he's trying to, uh, uh, to reason through that. Uh, and then in the second act, he makes another decision that I, I won't articulate. Uh, uh, it is a spoiler. Um, and it's, uh, it's a grave decision. I, I don't mean that in the pun sense, like Shakespeare would use it. It's, it, it is a decision that makes him dead. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't know that at the time. But it, it's a serious decision, is, is what I mean to say. He gets a chance to grab at this opportunity to just take control over his life for one moment in the midst of this trial where he's being accused of being sexually monstrous, where he's being called the N-word, where he's being called boy. Um, uh, uh, this is a horror show. Plus, he's been in jail seven months uh, already. Um, uh, so we get to, he has to do more than just plead for his life. Um, uh, we get to see some inner life there. I mean, one of the things that attracted me to to this project, aside from the people involved, um, is is you know, the perspective of the, of the creative team that they wanted to kind of eliminate as many instances or, or, or uh, of of this white savior um, motif that is throughout literature, even with great. Writers. I mean, I'll, I'll say it that you know, like Harper Lee wouldn't be the first uh, amazing writer who was blind to the full lives of minorities, of women, of uh, other people. So, like, yeah, I don't. It might not be safe for other folks. It's, you know, you could be, I don't want anyone to get in trouble. But it's true. You know, so, um, and 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 this creative team wanted to address that, and so that was attractive to me. Um, and and one of the immediate ways to do that is to give these two characters um, whose lives are affected, one like it, 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 one to the point where it, his, his life comes to an end, um, by, by, by what goes on. And you know, one of the, I love the book, but it was problematic. You have this thing that happened in, to, to this black person um, in, that affects the entire black community, and it's seen through the eyes of this white family and this white little girl. Beautifully told, but it was it was it it, it it's to me that's problematic, um, and that was the, those are some of the things I think the uh, the the playwright wanted to address and bring to life and kind of fill out uh, on on stage, and uh, and I think he accomplished that. I read somewhere that 
uh, Harper Lee's friendship with Truman Capote influenced her construction of the character of Dill. And I was wondering, as you, you know, you worked the rehearsal to create that character, was that an idea in your mind somehow of the, the, the fact that Capote had, and I guess it is rumored that he helped edit the book or something like that? I'd, Capote's life was infused into the text. I mean, the, his backstory was 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 added in uh, in, a, in a in a small dose, and it is known that he that Dill is based off Capote. But what I realized, and and so yes, I, I that was a gigantic part of the inspiration for for this Dill. But what I also realized was that this piece is it's about race, but it's also about identity. It's about intersectionality. That it's not just one thing, and that was something that kind of you know, blew my mind, and that it's, you have a protagonist who is, kind of feels like a boy, she's a tomboy, and her best friend is this queer boy, and this is a book that is taught ad nauseum, and we don't talk about that, and so I was really excited about exploding that, and making sure that this is going to be talked about from now on. It is masterfully, masterfully handled, because it, 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 again, is one of these things that appears so natural on the the stage that you just you see it in front of you without having to think about it. Well, thank you. Well, that's his doing. Too. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I, that, that's I appreciate that. But um, uh, well, this whole thing has been a triumph of collaboration. But during that process that Celia was talking about, the the labs, the the six week rehearsal period, uh, uh, the previews with Gideon and and Dill, uh, I found oftentimes we were following each other. You would do something. Um, and Bart and I, standing at the back of the theater, would say, that's great, I get that. Let's oh, sort wow. of uh, codify that and um, uh, you know, let's, let's make more out of that. Uh, so uh, I was following Gideon a lot. So um, why don't we start here, ma'am? Hi, thank you all for being here today. Um, I actually had a question for Gideon and Celia. Um, you talked a little bit about how you're deciding or figuring out like when you were an adult and when you were a child. Um, but I was wondering, once you had figured that out, how did you kind of try to inhabit the characters differently and like take that knowledge into your performance and try to make those characters slightly different? I think it was sort of twofold that there was the the physicality of kids. There's this really amazing um, interview with Harper Lee where she was talking about growing up in Monroeville and she just said, you know, we had nothing. There was nothing there for us to do. So we were, our imaginations were the only escape from the monotony of a summer in Monroeville, Alabama. And that somehow just like planted a strong seed in me that's like, what do you do if you're a kid and there's nothing to do? And so a lot of what we ended up building physically had to do with like, what do, what kind of games do kids play? Like what, just how do you use the world around you in an empty space, like a stage that has nothing and try to create the life, the physical life of a kid. And so that was a, a big part of it. I think you know, vocally, this sort of in and out of like, when I'm scout and who's eight, it's like pitched way up here. And then when I'm talking a little bit older, I drop into a lower <laughs> register. Like, that's just a stupid theater trick that, yeah. <laughs> you know, is like as old as time. But that, you know, there is that as well. Um, and then I think, honestly, the writing took care of so much of, um, who we were and and how these little creatures you know went through the play that there was so much that was there that I felt like you we could always do less particularly when we were playing the kids that like I would have these ideas and Bart was like don't do that <laughs> um, I was like no problem um, but that it that the writing was good enough and it supported uh, us both as as children as and adults that when in doubt do less. I can't improve on that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm sorry. I just think Celia really soft sold um, uh, the uh, what these guys uh, are doing. It's not just about dropping down uh, a, a register. Um, I, it is. I, they are doing something. I've been doing it since early in rehearsals, but it just got better and better. They're doing something much more nuanced 
uh, uh, than that, and it's to me a, a magic trick. Um, uh, uh, it's it's the slightest adjustments uh, uh, in their posture, slightest adjustment in their voice, but uh, just also the slight adjustment in their attitude, um, uh, uh, going back and forth, which they are doing, uh, you know, n not just throughout the play, but they'll do it throughout a scene, um, uh, uh, inside of a scene. Uh, and it's not at all jarring. I have never been a particular fan of grown men and women uh, uh, acting like children, like I, I don't know, like Jerry Lewis or Luke Costello. It just creeps me out uh, a, a little bit. Um, but this, and this isn't at all like that. Uh, and so I just think that you made it sound much easier than it actually is. <laughs> Uh, my question is, whenever you adapt something, people forget that's a different medium and it's a different time. And maybe it's just me, I'm watching too many YouTube reviews, but uh, people are, get very aggressive. They take the original as the gospel and everything that deviates is like a sacrilege. How, where do you take the courage to address it and changes, and especially to the actors, how do you deal with the backlash you get and the critiques if people say, yeah, you ruined my childhood or whatever? I mean, I think it was, it was definitely terrifying in the beginning. Um, and it was definitely terrifying as a, conceptually to, for an adult to play a child. Like, that is, that is um, that's off-putting. Um, but I will say, I, I think what's kind of remarkable is that because the medium is different, we get to do whatever we want. So it, it is a theatrical piece. And so in a strange way, having, let, let's just say, adults playing children, the audience is sitting there and they go, oh, this is not what I know. This is not the movie. This is not the book. This is a theater piece that can only be seen right now on this stage. And in a strange way, what, what I was most afraid of is actually what, what freed us all up. Can I ask a quick follow-up question to that? Which is, sure. what do you hear from audiences at this? I mean, one of the amazing things about Broadway, you leave the stage door and there's a bunch of people waiting to talk to you. What did you hear from those audiences? When a lot of people go, oh man, I came in really not looking like this and <laughs> really not looking like adults playing kids. And, uh, 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 but I'll say what's, what's, what I find remarkable is that the cult of Mockingbird is big. And we're seeing, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of people who have never seen a play before. And that's really the really? kind of the most remarkable thing at the stage door. This is the first play they ever saw. And, and, and yeah, it's just, it's been, it's just been a remarkable experience. <laughs> We, um, uh, any New York City public school student can see the play for $10. Uh, and uh, so we've been doing matinees uh, that are entirely filled with, uh, uh, with students. Uh, and as uh, uh, Gideon said, um, uh, it, for a lot of them, it's their first time at a play. Um, they, are, they respond differently than a typical uh, Broadway audience does, but they are incredibly uh, enthusiastic and, and vocal about it. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're not jaded, right? So No. Um, uh, when they like something, uh, you know, he'll say something funny, and they'll laugh at it, and then they'll turn to the person next to them and kind of enjoy it all over again, and then they'll, <laughs> they'll all quiet each other down because they'll realize the play is continuing. No one hit pause. Uh, um, uh, and so they're kind of learning how to watch a play, but uh, uh, they are, they're, they're having a great experience, uh, uh, on top of which I, I think um, that there are our kids leaving the theater uh, who it, it never occurred to them uh, before that they might like doing what Benga and Gideon and Celia do and that they might be good at it. It just never occurred to them to try it. And I, I like to think that once in a while there's somebody who leaves the theater thinking that they might like doing what I do. Um, uh, and it never occurred to them uh, uh, to do that. So anyway, uh, if you couldn't guess, I'm proud of those $10 public school matinees. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. My question is for Aaron. Uh, one of my favorite things you've ever written was the open letter to your daughters uh, the morning oh, gee, thank after uh, Donald Trump was elected. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in this office at my desk, shaking, holding back tears, trying to stay professional, um, trying to figure everything out. And there was a part of that open letter that really got me where you said, well, what are we going to do? Uh, we'll fucking fight. We'll stand up. We'll roll up our sleeves because America did not stop becoming America overnight. 
And I'm wondering, when, in retelling this story and sharing it with so many audiences, American and globally, how much of this encompasses that fight you're talking about? Uh, that's a great question. First of all, thanks, thanks very much. Um, uh, it, when I wrote it, it wasn't uh, an open letter. It was, uh, I was on election night uh, 2016. Uh, I was in Toronto. I was about to start shooting a movie the next day, and I wasn't home. Uh, but I was talking to my daughter uh, all night as states started turning red and, uh, uh, and people started getting nervous. She was genuinely upset uh, uh, when this happened. And I was, you know, on the one hand, I was really proud that she'd become engaged uh, in something like this. But I saw how upset she was. And like a lot of people, I had been telling her for a year, for two years, Please, there's no way. It's never going to happen, you know. So when you're a father and that, you know, we break that kind of promise, it's tough. I wrote the email to her um, early in the morning East Coast uh, time, and a couple of hours later, a, a woman from VanityFair.com got in touch with me somehow. Uh, I guess my daughter's mom had maybe sent it to her. So that's how uh, uh, that happened. But yes. Uh, uh, is, I could, could have been a lot shorter by saying yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this is a, a part of that. You know, I enjoy writing romantically and idealistically, and Scout's repetition of All Rise, um, and, and particularly at the end, uh, is you know meant as a call to action. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll also just say that part of what has been so special about this experience is that I think there aren't that many spaces where we get to come together and process these big questions about our country and where we have been and where we are going. Um, church, I suppose, and Aaron gave a speech this morning about cathedrals and theaters that I was like, yes, that is what you're doing. But that, in fact, to come and see a play where there is a real transaction between the people on stage and the people in the audience. Like we, a, a play does not exist without the audience. A movie or a television show does. And to get to, during this time, have a real conversation and, and to create a space for all of us to come and be together with 1,400 other people and process these big questions about our country, it's like, it, it feels, Whatever you think about the play, you can think about the play, but that act of coming together is so deeply important and so moving to me to get to do every night. It's a gift. It is. I agree. Um, hi, so thank you for being here and for making some of my favorite things ever um, on TV and stage. And my question for Celia, because we talked a lot about, uh, you talked about uh, playing a child in this particular show, but I've seen you play a child on stage before I saw, saw you at Peter and the Starcatcher, and I listened to uh, Spelling Bee often, especially when I need to cry a little bit, um, like good mm -hmm cry. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to know if this is a coincidence or if it's something you're drawn to or if you see like Molly and Scout and all of us three different beings and it's just they happen to be children. It's funny. I think I don't know why I play kids. I really don't. I mean, I, I, it was certainly not anything I set out to do. Um, but it has been a theme in my career. And there was a point when I was like, I'm done with this. I don't want to do it anymore. And, and then things kept coming up where I was like, oh, that's a really, really great part. And um, I don't know if it's that, yeah, it's, it's, I said to Gideon once, I was like, it feels like asking, I don't know if you guys know who Kelly O'Hara is, but she's this glorious soprano. Like, why do you keep playing these amazing ingenues? And it's like, there is something inside of her, the gifts that she was given, which are, is like this glorious voice that she just knows what to do. And I, the only thing I can liken it to is that there is something inside of me that knows what to do. And obviously, I really hope this is the last kid I play, but I bet it's not. I mean, there's a good chance that it's not, that I'm going to do it again, and that will be fine. But that, you know, it's, it's just something in... Um, in my career that has followed me. And I think probably your body of work always influences like 
what, what you know where I am now, and that I'm sure there is a part of Olive to a part of Molly to a part of Lauren the Glass Menagerie to you know you bring it all with you. So I think they're not completely separate ent entities. Um, but this is by f I mean I don't want to pick favorites, but Scout Finch, come on. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Uh, this is a question for you. Uh, first of all, I grew up watching The West Wing when I was seven, and it really means a lot to me, so I really Thank appreciate you it. Thank um, My question seven? is... Seven? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a young company. <laughs> it means a lot to my family as well. When they, they were older than seven when it was on. Um, uh, my question is, do you have any advice for managing the creative process, specifically um, you know, hitting deadlines and what to keep in mind when working against that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm probably the worst person uh, uh, to get advice from uh, on that. I, uh, it, you know, when, uh, the, in, when you're writing a play, when you're writing a movie, uh, and um, and you're not, and it's not going well. You're not writing well. Uh, you can call whoever is waiting for it, the producer, the studio, the uh, uh, the director, and you can say, "Hey, I'm, I've kind of run into a snowbank. I know I said I'd deliver the first draft in June. It'll probably be more like September. Uh, uh, that kind of thing." In television, uh, you can't do that. You have hard deadlines because of the air dates, which means that you have to write even when you're not writing well. Uh, and that's a, that's a really tough pill to swallow. And then you have to take that and put it on the table for the cast, uh, uh, for the table read. And that's, that's really difficult. And, th and then you have to point a camera at it. Um, I, and uh, so, I mean, did you ask me about managing anxiety? I'm just like <laughs> feeling anxiety. And I, 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 um, <clears throat> <laughs> Listen, uh, people ask me if I get writer's block. Writer's block is my default position. I am, uh, uh, I, I have periodic um, uh, bursts of, hey, I have an idea, um, a writable idea. Uh, but the rest of the time, I'm climbing the walls. I love writing. I hate not writing. Uh, I hate what I'm supposed to be writing, uh, and I can't. Uh, it, it drives me out of my mind. I'm making it worse. Uh, right? Uh, your anxiety? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's already much better. Uh, OK. I have no advice. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So, on that note, I'm sorry. I'm told we are out of time. Thank you so much. Thank Cecilia, you very Gideon, much. Aaron, Thank you. Kenga, and Jeff.